thankfully, we won the lottery to hold it in our city of Chicago rather than just stop it. We must create an exposition that will rise above Paris' exposition. So it is important that we must make our exposition more majestic. And it is absolutely imperative that we create a set of piece that will outline both the Eiffel Tower. All in two times. Now, let us unravel the great genius that lies in the National Show. medicine shop here. You surely can't be running this all by yourself. Where's your husband? I got no time for your strikes, alright? This show needs to be finished now. Well, I gotta say, it was a dream come true when I heard that I could be one of the heads to carry out the construction of the expo. I felt that although I received previous success with my other buildings, nothing could really position myself as an elite architect better than the construction of the fair. And so as a result, I felt that like my guidance and my influence was a necessary factor to establish myself as a leader while building the fair and, to, and for the other elite architects to follow. And so, I wanted to make sure that each architect could portray their own different kind of characteristic in their designs, but not suffocate the designs of the other architects. And so the point was to piece all these different varieties of design into one, like, one grand puzzle so that the world could enjoy. And for the, success, for the success of the fair, I felt that I had to make some additional and necessary precautions and measurements to protect the tranquility and safety of the fair. And so that is why I added a lot of police departments, fire departments, and such. Because I didn't want the depravity of Chicago to be something that would affect the results of the fair. Hey, Philip. Can yes. I have a moment of time, please? Yes, Mr. Berman. All right, um, listen, Philip. I think you're gonna have to increase your work hours late into the night. How long? And until 4 in the morning? 4 in the morning? You've already been working 14 hours a day! Anymore, we're going on strike! Listen, 
I got no time for your strikes, alright? This building needs to be finished now. I can easily replace it with any other vagrant on the streets. Despite the many problems that us architects encountered during the construction of the World Fair, the fair nevertheless provided benefits for both the people and the city of Chicago itself. From opening day, huge amounts of visitors traveled in trains headed towards Chicago. Despite the fact that the fair was still incomplete, when the fair first opened, my lungs were the first amazement. And when George Ferris finally completed the Ferris wheel, it had definitely out eiffel the Eiffel Tower. The Ferris wheel had become the most popular attraction of the fair. Everywhere, there was growing interest in the exposition. What visitors liked best were not the exhibits, but the buildings, waterways, and scenery, and that the fair had a definitely surprised them. As the popularity grew, I couldn't stand the dirtiness of the streets. Trash was everywhere, so we ordered litter to be cleaned up. While the black city to the north lay steeped in smoke and garbage, visitors found clean public bathrooms, pure water, electric streetlights, and even a sewage processing system in the white city of the fair. The exposition was Chicago's greatest pride. Thanks to Daniel Burnham, of course, the city had proved that it could accomplish something marvelous against obstacles that by any measure should have humbled the builders. The sense of ownership was everywhere. Chicago was host to the world at that time, and everybody was a part of it. Chicago had indeed proved itself worthy of France, and definitely New York City too. The white city became Chicago's beacon of hope amongst its dirty and crime-ridden streets. People came by the millions to view the new exposition, filled with new technology and different cultures. They were amazed by everything from Edison's street lamps to the belly dancing gypsies. A place of true wonder and magic, people believed the white city would change and save Chicago forever. However, where there is light, there will be shadows. In the midst of the white city's construction came Holmes, a devious killer that took advantage of the white city's presence in a different way. I remember when I was still a kid, I had a great fear of the doctor's office. See, it was different for kids back then. We would see adults walk in, pay with cash, and receive clear bottle pills with no question asked. There were also books filled with incredibly detailed pictures of the human bodies. What was the most fearsome and engrossing was the human skeleton that hung in the office. Regardless to say, I was scared of the doctor's office. One day, however, two kids dragged me into the office and forced me in front of the smiling skeleton. It was a wicked and dangerous thing to do to a child of tender years and health, but it proved a heroic method of the treatment. Destined ultimately to cure me of my fears, and to inculcate me, first a strong feeling of curiosity, and later a desire to learn, which resulted years afterwards in my adopting medicine as a profession. I remember those kids watching me, expecting me to scream, but curiosity overwhelmed me, and I just stared at the skeleton in wonder. They ran away from me, and I, when I turned to look at them, they already ran away. But I wasn't sure why. I never knew. When I first entered Chicago, I knew that it was the place. The atmosphere was just to my liking. The tinge of chaos, energy, and excitement was just what I needed. Miss Holton, you have a fine medicine shop here. You surely can't be running this all by yourself. Where's your husband? He's been deaf for a while, so now there's only this old lady here to run this shop. Oh, you poor old sweet lady. Running this shop is not a job fit for someone as old as you. Here, let me take over the burdens in the shop. Just sign this deed over here. Once you sign this, the shop will be mine. The very first time I met Holmes was when he came into the pharmacy my husband and I owned. He was indeed the most charming and understanding man I had ever met. And whenever I thought of his sincerity, I always felt a feeling of content. But by the time, my husband was dying of cancer. The great burden of caring for him and managing the store had fallen upon me. And when Holmes offered to help me turn the drugstore into a thriving establishment, I simply could not resist the offer. So I sold the store to him shortly after my husband's death. But the young doctor was nice enough to allow me to continue living in the second store apartment. I couldn't work as a druggist until I passed a licensing exam in Illinois, so I registered under the name Holmes, after Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's detective story. I needed somewhere to start my practice, and Miss Holton was a perfect starting point. She was an old widow running a drugstore. It was a rather easy matter to obtain it from her. A few sympathetic words, promise of free money monthly through rent, and I got her to sign the deed over me. I obviously got rid of her soon after. When people asked me where she went, I simply told them that she went to California. Permanently. Holmes used his charms to his advantage. He constructed a hotel with a furnace built for killing hidden in the basement. 
Holmes swindled the construction workers by firing them before their payment was due. He also obtained free furnishings by buying them on credit under non-existent names. Holmes was completely aware of Chicago and the opportunities it provided. People were disappearing left and right on the streets, so the police never noticed the women that were checking into Holmes' hotel without ever checking out. He lured women into his castle of death by the dozens and enjoyed every moment of pleasure that Chicago presented to him. The entire city of Chicago was helping me. People were disappearing left and right, and the tiny police force could hardly investigate every single case. The hospitals were in drastic need of skeleton bones for the increasing number of medical students. Women, trying to find new opportunities in Chicago, would come to my shop and say yes to all my requests, thinking that that was the appropriate response to experiencing a new city. Why, even the great Chicago World Fair was built three blocks down from my shop. That increased the number of people that visited my shop and were looking for a place to stay temporarily while visiting the fair. I mean, I knew Chicago was the right place to be. Everything about it was aiding me in my efforts to secretly bring women into my gas vault. And I must say, I was enjoying it enormously. I was born with the evil in me. I couldn't help the fact that I was a murderer no more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. It is who I am. And the whole world in Chicago seems to agree with me on that. And so ends The Great Tale of Chicago's World Exposition. The two stories drawn parallel reveal the true nature of the world. Burnham's White City was built to bring hope to Chicago, while Holmes Hotel was built to bring death. When one was driven by desire to better an ailing city, while the other was driven by greed and lust. This true event America's past comes to show that wherever there is good, there is also evil close behind. Holmes was that evil, or as the author Eric Larson phrased it, Holmes was the devil in the White City.